Welcome back to The Money Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Blake King, power systems engineer at Galaxy Digital. We talk about how ERCOT works, what signals energy traders look for in the market, and how batteries and Bitcoin mining loads interact on the grid. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ-listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data-dependent stories at theminermag.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Blake, thank you for joining the show. We have a lot to talk about with energy markets in Texas, which is your full-time job. Last time we spoke with you, I believe was close to 18 months ago, about the same topic, which was like Bitcoin miners going down to Texas and was there going to be enough room for all of them? And a lot of your predictions came true. So I'm glad to have you on the show today and go through everything that you're dealing with on a daily basis. Yep. Thanks for having me. I think I also came, I think that was my first appearance. I also think I've been again recently last april no it was last april shortly after that one i think steve barber had a comment about uh, uh mega mines versus small mines i think you had me on to discuss that as like a retort so but yes. happy to be here again always love talking to you uh so yeah i do remember that one that was a good article we need steve to write some more uh he, yeah. he stirred up some controversy there yeah as much as you good. can yeah so like that the bigger picture here for the audience is it's really hot in Texas right now, and we've—I don't know if we hit peak. I think we have hit peak for in terms of demand on the Texas grid last few days consecutively. And it's June. I think the peaks were expected in July. That's putting pressure on a lot of different generation capacities within Texas. It's surprising some people, not surprising other people. Bitcoin miners are obviously in the thick of this, as they operate about two gigawatts plus or minus somewhere in there uh, on top of the grid. And so they're, they're part of this grid now, right? And so we have to talk about them and how they fit into this grid. Uh, I want to throw it to you to first like walk us through how ERCOT works, and then we'll generally work from there all the way to the mining topics. Yeah, so we did hit a peak. We hit a June peak, uh, I think it was yesterday, and we also hit a summer peak. So really, I think the, the peak last year was about 80 gigawatts, and that occurred in July. And so July and August are normally the hotter months where we expect peaks to happen. So it's all. It's only June. We already hit a summer peak for ERCOT, which is new, which is an overall peak. And uh, we've been setting new June peaks as it comes. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, the even bigger and more interesting part of it, for me at least, is that the prices have been low during the peaks. This isn't unexpected necessarily. I mean, I think since last year, you know, I had the numbers up earlier, but since last year, we've doubled solar capacity in ERCOT, right? So I think, and you'll have to forgive me for just like riffing these numbers, but I think it was seven gigawatts of solar last year. Now we have 14 gigs installed. And that's just a lot of power. I mean, that's a lot of power to come in and like basically force prices down during some of the hotter parts of the day. I mean, ERCOT peak is usually around 5 p.m. Central. And so solar is still kicking at this time around that. So you'll see we're seeing these huge demand and like not that big of prices, which is really interesting from like a power markets perspective. So, yeah, I, I saw you talking about that. I saw a few other people talking about that. It's cool to see uh, like renewables taking on the grid, even though a lot of Bitcoin miners or Bitcoiners, I should say, don't like that too much. Tell me a little bit about the ERCOT dynamic. So for, for a few minutes here, the 10,000 foot view for those who are not familiar with the system. Sure. So ERCOT is a deregulated market for energy supply. So what that generally means is that you can compete to sell and buy energy in certain parts of ERCOT. There's also a minority of areas that are still kind of the traditional vertically integrated. But for the most part, the interesting part of it is that you can compete to buy and sell electricity and there's a spot market that ERCOT facilitates for that electricity. So, you know, generally like the spot market prices change every five minutes. There's a kind of a complicated algorithm that determines the prices that ERCOT manages. And these prices are supposed to both reflect the actual marginal value of electricity at any specific location. And they're also supposed to provide like a long-term signal for people to build generation assets or to come to ERCOT to consume electricity, et cetera. So if prices are high, you know, that's supposed to provide us an incentive for people to develop more generation. If prices are low, it's supposed to incentivize people to come and 
you know, build batteries or build load and things like that. And so it's kind of interesting that we've, that's what we've seen with the Bitcoin miners. They all flock to ERCOT, you know, to build and, and take part in this, in this market. And so, so you have this spot market for electricity and, uh, most of the time you can either, if you're a large industrial customer, you can either be exposed to this spot market directly, right? Where you're just, you're taking this floating spot price of power and then you're turning off when the price is high or you can hedge it and there's there's all sorts of different ways that you can hedge power you can buy it forward you can allow like a power supplier to give you a fixed price and, and you let them worry about it there's all sorts of different flavors of doing this and this is where people become power traders and do kind of sophisticated stuff so that's that's like the high level view of, of ERCOT and again it's all it's all predicated on this price signal aspect which is that we're trying to value the electricity and it's both supposed to reflect you know how valuable it is right now and it's also supposed to provide that that longer term price signal and so to tie it into the, your actual question the generators that are producing electricity all submit to ERCOT who is the facilitator of the market they submit to them a, a current operating plan or a COP that basically tells ERCOT when they're going to be available, right? You basically say, I'm a natural gas plant. I'm going to be available tomorrow because I believe the prices will be high. And then they also submit to ERCOT like a bid curve, which is basically, you know, I can sell this many megawatts at this price. I can sell that many megawatts for this price. And it usually looks kind of linear, you know, basically it starts at your minimum, which is what you, the minimum that you could produce to be online. And then it kind of goes upward. Basically, if you want me to produce more, you're going to have to pay me more marginally. Then once you submit all of this to ERCOT, ERCOT basically stack ranks these and turns on the cheaper units first and kind of works its way up the curve until it finds like the marginal unit, right? Like the last unit that it needed to turn on to meet the load. And then that unit basically sets the price. You know, there's all sorts of nuances here, but that sets the price. And so if you can kind of think of it, everyone that is able to produce electricity for cheaper, you know, makes more margin effectively is the way that this works. So with all this solar and wind, they bid zero, you know, they kind of push that curve. And so, you know, they're selling power for zero. ERCOT has less ways up to go with regard to the thermal stack. And that's generally kind of what we've seen happen, right? Renewables have come online and you know they've done what they what the intended purpose uh, was to like displace you know fossil fuel generation they've literally done that and now ERCOT has to dispatch them less and like uh critics say that there's downsides to that right if you if you don't pay the thermal generators to be on sometimes then they won't be there you know obviously when the sun doesn't shine and when the wind doesn't blow and to some extent that's true and you know there's solutions that people have tried to offer for that you know maybe we keep them on as a reserve, you know, pay them some other way, but still don't burn the uh, fossil fuels. And stuff. So that's that's a record from ten thousand feet. Um, hopefully, hopefully it's good enough. No, that was awesome. I uh, appreciate that. On the demand side, I'm curious, how did like the demand signals get aggregated for for ERCOT? So it's it generally like telemetry, right? So they're they're literally like reading load, right? They're they're reading the amount of load that's coming online, and they're setting that as their target. So it's like, all right, we're and there's also a whole lot of forecasting that goes into it, right? There's a lot of brain power that goes into load forecasting and you know you have to combine that with the solar forecast and the wind forecast to just find how much thermals you're going to need right so there's all sorts of forecasting that's then checked with the telemetry that's coming online and then there's also frequency like it, it's kind of uh how they used to do it decades ago back before they were so sophisticated in this regard is the generators would really just kind of chase the frequency of this system right like if the frequency of the system which is normally 60 hertz if it starts to get a little higher right then then they produce less and then if it starts to get below 60 they produce more uh, to try and just keep that frequency right at 60 because that's that's what tends to happen if you don't have enough supply and you're just there's so much demand and there's not enough generation your frequency starts to dip below 60 and so the normal thing to do at that point is kick back up the supply and, and you'll see you can look on the ERCOT dashboard they actually track like real-time frequency on the system and you'll kind of see it just kind of ping pong uh, between like the upper and lower limit around 60 hertz exactly so that's kind of how they how they do it there's also signals that the demand side can give to ERCOT right so 
like there's a, a day ahead market, right? Which is Urkbot facilitates this opportunity for generators and loads to buy their power the day before the operating day, right? So if you're a load and you're buying, you know, they can say, oh, loads bought, you know, 50 gigawatts of megawatts today. That gives some inclination of how much load is going to be online and what they're willing to pay for it, right? So there's all sorts of different signals that really sophisticated groups at URCA use to kind of make this determination. Gotcha. Okay, I want to hand it over to you to talk about some of the price signals or other signals that you use for, for or actually in general scope, how energy traders think about what they're up to. Um, maybe not for your specific assignment at Galaxy Digital, but in terms of like someone who's on the Texas grid, maybe operating as a miner or a generator, what sort of signals are they like logging into or caught every day and looking at in order to successfully work within this market? Sure. The most important signal in, in my mind is the real-time pricing, right? So that is that is the, the most important signal with regard to the actual value of the electricity being produced, right? And that's that's what the market is attempting to do and kind of the way that they do it. You know, they, they take the marginal uh, value of the electricity being produced by the marginal generation unit, and then they also add, you know, congestion costs into that in this really nuanced way. And then there's also scarcity costs. Right. So scarcity is is one of the most interesting aspects of the market, which is right. Let, let's say that, um, you know, we're at 80 gigawatts and all of that is met with solar. Right. Like so like like pretend world where there's 80 gigawatts of available solar or more and it's all met with solar. But let's say that there's no thermal generation available. There's no any sort of like marginal reserve, right? Like it's just, you're just mashing with the solar. And let's say there's, you know, a thousand megawatts of headroom, right? Like there's just not much generation available if load were to ramp up, right? ERCOT actually values that margin as scarcity and that's called scarcity pricing. So even if solar met the load and solar bids at zero, so theoretically the energy value would be zero because there's only 1000 megawatts of margin, ERCOT adds to this price. And this is how you get prices in the thousands most of the time, is that ERCOT is valuing that scarcity aspect that we don't have much margin left. And so as a, you know, as a consumer or as a generator, what you really want to look for is this real-time price that's supposed to be valuing things like margin that's remaining or things like who's setting, setting the cost. So there's that real-time aspect of it. And then there's also just the price that people are offering for forward power, right? So there's a pretty robust market for longer term hedges where, you know, people that work at banks like wholesale, wholesale power sellers or buyers are, are pricing in markets, right? So uh, what was it like a, a week ago, we had one day in real time where the price went up to four thousand, five thousand dollars and it stayed there for four or five days. Right? And this was in June, like mid June. Well, whenever that happened, the price that wholesalers were offering for July and August just like tripled, like quadrupled, right? Like they, they were offering to sell July and August for like, you know, sixty bucks, eighty bucks or something. Again, I'm making these numbers up. But then all of a sudden it was $200, $300, just because all of a sudden now, because that real-time risk is there, they're saying, oh shoot, we need to go back in and, and model in like, what if this happens? You know, we need to charge more just in case. And again, you know, they're looking at it from, I'm selling you this as like a financial instrument. And like, when I sell you the fixed price, I'm then going to wear this spot price risk. Like I might have to pay this spot price in order for you to get the fixed price, you know, or hedge it on the back end. And I, this can get really hairy really quick. So uh, I'll stop by how those wholesalers work. But basically those forward markets, the pricing that occurs there is really interesting to see. Yeah, and I'll bring actually a, a tweet up from your colleague, Austin Storms at Galaxy. He was talking about this in a Twitter thread with me yesterday, uh, saying that there are, quote, major forecasting issues with VREs that make price formation complicated cause big dart spreads and real-time velocity in both directions. So that is a mouthful for anyone who's <laughs> not literate, literate in uh, energy markets. Explain to me a little bit about like what he's talking about here. To, to me, the I read a little bit more and he added some context there as well. It seems like 
the renewable market, since it's so new, is causing some new issues for energy traders or anyone interacting with this market for the first time? Definitely. I mean, that's one way that's one way to put it. It's um it goes back to the forecasting piece, right? So so let's talk about the day ahead market, right? So and whenever he mentioned dart spread, right, what he's talking about is the the ratio of the day ahead price to the real time price. Right? Because the the day ahead market is supposed to be a good representation of what the real time price is going to be. And you you kind of always want the forward price of a commodity to kind of match like the real time spot price as closely as possible. So what goes into the day ahead market price? Right? Well, uh, ERCOT runs like a, a model effectively of this bidding and people submit offers as generators. People submit bids as a load to buy and you want to clear. Well, what is, what is your decision to offer or bid informed by, right? It's informed by what the price is you think is going to be in real time, right? So if you think the real time price is going to be really high, then you're willing to buy at a higher price in the day ahead, right? And so how do you think that the price is going to be high? Well, you look at the load forecast and you look at the solar forecast and you look at the wind forecast. So if the load forecast is coming out and it's really high and the solar forecast and the wind forecast come out and they're really low, right? Then those are, those are some variables that you might say, oh shoot, we might be in a bad scenario where it's going to be scarcity pricing because, you know, we've got a lot of load, not much renewables. So I'm willing to buy power at a higher price, right? Like I might want to buy power at like $40 or $50, but because tomorrow looks really scary and I want to run, I'd be willing to buy it at $100, right? Because you you really just don't want to be in a situation where the price is 5000 and you're not hedged because you thought 100 was too expensive, right? So people go into this day ahead market and they bid it up. And so the day ahead market might clear and it might be in like the multiples of 100 or even thousands sometimes. Like there have been a couple of days where it cleared like over $1,000 for, for some amount of hours. Well, then the real time comes and the prices are in the dirt. Like the prices are like 10 bucks, $20. And it turns out that the load forecast that everyone was looking at was too bullish, right? Like it, they, they over forecasted. Uh, so the load forecast is like a couple gigawatts too high. And then you look at the solar and wind and you see, oh, the solar forecast was too low. Like solar has come through and just like pumped the numbers up. And then wind as well is like way over the forecast, right? So now everyone that bought power in the day ahead market is like, oh, shoot, well, I should have just, you know, I shouldn't have bought in the day ahead market. I should have ridden the index. And all the generators are saying, oh, well, this is great. Like we sold in the day ahead market now. We got more money than we otherwise would have, right? And so that's this big day ahead real-time spread that he's talking about. And you you always want there to be some premium in the day ahead market and forward market, right? Because someone is taking the risk and you want to price that risk. And so you always want the day ahead to be priced at a, a, a somewhat of a premium to the real-time value of power. But you don't want it to be so huge that people are looking at it and saying, well, we're not getting accurate information on the market, right? We're not, we're not able to accurately price this stuff in a way that makes sense. And really what happens, if you think about it, is you start to get a lot of speculation, right? Like a lot of people start selling virtuals in the day ahead market, which means you know, selling power that you don't have, right? So that's, that's one way that a lot of power traders make money is they sell virtual power that they don't own in the day ahead market and then they just buy it back at the real time, right? So you sell 10 megawatts at $1,000 and then real time is only 10 bucks. You made whatever that spread is. And so you really kind of push for that kind of behavior rather than like actual hedging behavior. So it, it is interesting. And again, that, that forecasting piece, right? Now there's, there's other levers of forecasting that people have to worry about. There's the solar forecast, the wind forecast, the load forecast. You know, it's uh, more of a forecasting kind of world that we live in now. Gotcha. I I'm thinking of like some entities or groups in Texas that would have to be put up to doing this. Bitcoin miners being one, uh, industrial sites, even cities. How do these people interact with the grid? Are they hiring people to energy trade on them on their behalf? And if they mess up, what happens? So if you mess up and you don't price things correctly and you're just out for a day, is that sort of what happens? Or right. is there an ability to like get back into the market if things change quickly? So the, the general market 
in ERCOT and like the deregulated kind of world here is that only uh, retail electric providers can face ERCOT and participate in the market, right? So these are power suppliers, they're utilities, like some people call them utilities and though they're not. So the, the general idea, if you think about it, is if you live in Texas in one of these deregulated areas, you can actually shop for your power. Like you go to a website, there's like 150 different options, right? And they all, they all have different rates, right? And, and what they do is you pay them a fixed price for your electricity just as you use it, right? Like everyone understands like a utility bill, right? They then turn around and they are, are wearing your load in the wholesale market, like in the ERCOT market, they are exposed to your load at the wholesale price, right? Now, they then choose to hedge that however they want, right? Like they can give you a fixed price and then they can just pay the wholesale price on the back end, right? But that's like a terrible strategy. Uh, and they, what they usually do is implement some sort of hedging where they'll like, they'll buy some of your power fixed forward and then they'll wear something like that. So that's normally how people interact with the ERCOT market generally. For Bitcoin miners or large commercial and industrial customers, since we buy so much power, it's a little more flexible. So like, Sometimes the retail electric provider will sell you the type of fixed power that they themselves bought, right? They're saying, oh, well, you want to be online all the time anyways. You know, why don't you, why don't I just buy this block of power and then sell it to you with some markup for risk that I'm taking, et cetera, and things like that. So that's another way that the power suppliers interact with miners. There's also some miners that are doing business like directly co-located with generators. Right. And that gets even even more interesting and more kind of bespoke and how they can how they can uh, negotiate that contract. Um, and then, like the, like I said, I have to add, you know, there are some places in Texas that have like the vertical utilities, right, where it's not necessarily like you can shop for power. It's just like you live in this town. That town is your utility. You don't have an option. Right. And then that utility turns around and they participate in the aircraft market on your behalf. So, so in most of these scenarios where you're just paying the power supplier, they're doing whatever they're buying in the day ahead market, like I said, or, or they're like being exposed to the wholesale rate of floating spot price, like I said, or doing, they're the ones that are making all those decisions in the situation where you're a big customer, you kind of have more leverage, but you're still really, uh, limited to what your power supplier is willing to do, right? Like, and you might need to, you know, give them collateral for them to do that because all of the things in the ERCOT market require you to post like a lot of money in order to participate. So that's like another aspect is that most of these power suppliers, what they're, what they're helping you do as a customer is facilitate the credit posting in the market, which is a, a big, a big driver and limitation in the space. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks for that explanation. Uh, didn't think of it that way. Going on to last two subjects. We're going to finish on batteries and flexible loads and want to get your thoughts on that. Uh, I think we're going to have someone from a battery team on in the near future. Fingers crossed. Right. We'll, we'll nail that. Uh, but just wanted to think about like the market this summer and how you're seeing things out. I follow Doug Lewin from Stoke Energy and he's been on the show before. I like his takes uh, for someone who's as uninformed as I am about it. Seems like June has been way more busy than expected. You've noticed, noted earlier the two historic peaks, one for the summer, one for the month of June. July and August are coming. I believe July is historically the hottest month in Texas and probably most places in the Northern Hemisphere. What are your thoughts on like the end of the summer and what Bitcoin miners should be expecting? Well, miners are probably doing a lot of curtailing for 4CP if I had to, uh, if I had to guess. So that means that a lot of the, a lot of the hottest days, you're not going to see a lot of Bitcoin mining activity or industrial load in between the hours of like, you know, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. They're just going to be offline. Batteries have really come in pretty clutch. I think I think we spoke about it on the Twitter spaces about, you know, the coal plant that tripped offline that was basically met by batteries. And so you see, I think you're going to see a lot of that. I think batteries are also, you know, really heavily bidding into the ancillary services market, which is basically like a secondary market that Urkai uses to facilitate these changes, right? Like if a, if a generator trips offline, Right, ERCOT then calls on the ancillary service market to fill that gap, and so batteries are you know making up a lion's share of those markets. 
Um, and they're also, I think it's interesting, like also what batteries are offering into the market. You know, that's, that's something that I haven't really done a lot of research on, but it'll be interesting to, you know, identify, you know, if, if you're a battery, can you bid into the market at a thousand dollars or like $500 or like whatever it is? Cause most resources, like if you think of your natural gas or your coal plant, they have to submit like reasonable marginal cost, right? Like if, if it costs you, you know, $50 a megawatt hour in fuel, you can't just offer that into the market at 500, right? It has to be like a reasonable marginal cost. But for batteries, what is the marginal cost? You know, it's, it's really your opportunity cost from selling it at a different time. And so that's kind of an interesting aspect of as batteries make up more and more volume of, of the grid, and then they maybe start competing with each other. You know, how does this turn out? Does it turn out to where if batteries are all using the same vendor for their software, then is there like some weird market power aspect where they can all bid very similar like pricing and kind of gap up the price? You know, I don't know. It's, it's fairly interesting, but but I am happy to see that the batteries are kind of making up for the coal plant tripping and stuff like that. I think that's good. Yeah, I mean, flexible loads, like the 4CP stuff, I mean, I think, you know, they're doing what's expected, which is be offline. I think I think the the issue that, arose, that arises, and I think what I talked about the first time I was on your show, was that, you know, the, the grid is also a big coordination problem, right? Like, that's what the grid operator really needs to know. They need to know what you're doing and when you're doing it so that they can operate the grid well. Um, and so, you know, two gigawatts of Bitcoin mining that are coming off during the peak is great, right? But if you all come off at the same time, that's not great because, you know, ERCOT has to manage that delta between the load and the generator. So I think, and I I think I'm gonna reiterate what I said the first time, which is that you're gonna start to see these large flexible loads, like Bitcoin miners, you know, hydrogen, ammonia, you know, concrete plants or whatever. You're gonna start to see these be treated more and more like generators with ramp rate limitations and stuff like that. And that's already been coming out of the large flexible load task force uh, that ERCOT's been facilitating. It's not you know, set in stone yet. I don't think there's anything in the nodal protocols, but ramp rate limitations where you, you can't just drop everything all at once. You know, you have to send telemetry to ERCOT so that they know what's going on. You know, I think that's going to be you know a bigger consideration into doing kind of like large industrial uh, loads in ERCOT. Last question I want to leave you on. I know that Texas implemented similar system to California did last year, which was like this mass tech system, right? Like, so mm -hmm. if you if you want people to turn off, all these consumers to turn off, ERCOT, I understand it has the ability to ask consumers to start ramping off on their side. How do you think about a system like that or other systems like smart grids in a house where I'm able to like turn off people's thermostats up or down? Um, how do you think about those systems compared to the bigger industrial players like batteries or large flexible loads. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think it's uh, like obviously the reliability of the grid is paramount, right? Like you 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 want to avoid a blackout at at all costs because it, it there's you know lives at stake. It takes a long time to start up a grid from blackout. A lot of coordination, and you just generally want to avoid that. I think in market solutions are better, right? So. Some something that still preserves the price signal, you know that that we want, right? We we want prices to be high. Like if ERCOT is worried about not having enough generation, then the average price should be pretty high because we want to we want to make sure we have that incentive for generators to develop. Um, but if ERCOT does out of market solutions like you know asking for conservation things like that, you could be hampering the price signal and not providing that longer term signal. So, you know, I, I'm a fan of market solutions, but I do understand that if reliability is tantamount and that's what you want to do, and that's part of ERCOT's job is reliability, sometimes you have to implement these out-of-market solutions in order to uh, avoid any negative consequences. So uh, that's pretty much where I see it. I like the smart grid. I think the thermostat, smart thermostat thing is really cool. Um, the vehicle to grid stuff is also really cool. You know, even the home batteries are pretty neat. You know, I think it adds a layer of complexity to the control and operations of the grid. I mean, I don't know if you follow, uh, there's a guy on Twitter that I follow that always talks about, you know, how, how are we going to be doing the smart metering when 
we don't even know like which distribution feeder is connected to which house you know like how do you how do you do something so precise when you don't even have visibility on on things like that and and i think those those questions get glossed over sometimes with like the shiny object syndrome of how cool these things are but you know really you know grid operators still have like character limitations in their databases so it's going to take a while for us to really get up to speed on on what's possible you know, at the home or at the meter with how to control and coordinate that stuff at a higher level. Awesome. Blake, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hope to speak again with you soon. Yeah, it was great. Always have fun. With it.